Today we will continue with inductance. The topic is related to the previous chapters. And it is also a very nice, very useful topic in physics. It has many applications in daily life. So first of all, we will talk about the mutual inductance. What is mutual inductance? Here we have two coils. And in one of the coils, we have a time varying current. And then this time varying current induces an EMF within that second coil. This is mutual inductance. Or if you have a time varying current within that inner coil, then this induces an EMF in the outer coil. This is mutual inductance and it has many, many applications. I will also show you some applications in real life. And we will also see self inductance or only inductance. This is talking about a coil in a circuit, just a single coil in a circuit. Here we have an EMF, here we have a current in the circuit, and this is a coil in, in, in the circuit. This, is, um, this coil has self-inductance, and there is a relation between the EMF induced by time varying current within that circuit and also the self-inductance of the, that, that one. We will also talk about the energy stored in a magnetic field. Remember the previous topics. So uh, in, in capacitors, we can store the energy, right? So like in capacitors, also in inductors, we can store the energy uh, in a magnetic field. We will also talk about this. And um, in the second part of that lecture, we will see circuits that include both a resistor and inductor coil. So what we see here, there is a resistor, there is a coil inductor, okay? And this is EMF, there's, there's a current here like this. So we will deal with such circuits in the second lecture. And we will also deal with the circuits, including both capacitance and inductor. And we will also see the circuits include capacitance, resistor, and inductance. And we will talk about the electrical oscillations occur in that type of circuits. So this three types of circuits, RL circuit, LC circuit, LRC circuits. Um, we, we will spend a lot of time for these three types of circuits within the next lecture on Thursday. And today we will mainly concentrate on these three topics, motion inductance, self-inductance, and also energy in in, in, in coils in the circuits. So let's continue with mutual inductance. Let's consider here we have one coil with some certain N2 turns, and here we have another coil, bigger coil. This is coil one, this is coil two, with N1 turns, with N2 turns, and here we have a current I1 within the first coil you see. So if, if I apply current within that coil, then I will produce magnetic field lines, okay? So this field lines will produce magnetic flux within that coil here in the second coil, you see? So if I change, the current within the first coil, then I will change the magnetic field lines by time, okay? So this will produce a change in the magnetic flux by time. So by manipulating time here, we can manipulate the magnetic flux within the second coil. So this induces a EMF 
within that second coil. So the magnitude of that EMF within that second coil is given by N2 minus N2 minus is showing the direction of the EMF. Uh, N2 is the number of the turns in the second coil and the uh, magnetic flux in the second coil as a function of time. So this is the EMF produced within the second coil due to the change of the current in the first coil. So here we have magnetic flux. So what is the magnitude of magnetic flux? We know that that magnetic flux is proportional to the current within the first coil. So magnetic flux is proportional to I1. We can also represent that proportionality with that form. Here we have magnetic flux in the second coil and this is the current in the first coil. And here we have M21 this is proportionality constant, constant for that system. We will go, go into the detail in the next transparency. This is the current within that coil, first coil, and this is the number of turns within, within the second coil. So this M to one here, proportionality constant, is also called as Muschel inductance. Muschel in Turkish, you know, karşılıklı. Okay, Muschel inductance. The important thing here is that, let's consider that the current is zero here and there is no magnetic field, there is no flux here. So let's consider you apply current within the second coil. Okay, so you apply current here, then you will produce magnetic field lines and you will produce magnetic flux here in the first coil if you have current here. If you change the current by time within that coil, then you can change the flux here. So you can, you can also produce an EMF within the first coil by applying current changing by time within the second coil. I mean, vice versa, you can do that. So now let's continue. This is the EMF within the second coil due to the um, time varying current within the first coil. And this is the magnetic flux, which is given by Muschel inductance times current here in the first coil over number of turns in the second coil. And what is M21? M21 is given by number of turns in the second coil, magnetic flux in the second coil over I1, the current within the first coil. So instead of magnetic flux here, just put this one here, okay? And then finally we will have EMF in the second coil, which is given by minus Muschel inductance and the time varying current within the first coil. If you write the inductance within that first coil due to the time varying current here in the second coil, so the Muschel inductance will be same, okay? Muschel inductance to one is equal to Muschel inductance one, two. So th this is important. So this Muschel inductance is the Muschel inductance of this two coil system. Okay, then this is the induced EMF in coil two due to the time varying current here. This is the induced EMF in coil one due to the time varying current in the second coil. So what do you see here? We have M, M, this is M to one, this is M one, two, okay? And they are equal to each other. So M is given with that expression. Look at this one. Number of turns, flux over 
current, number of turns, flux over current. And in case of the second coil, number of turns, flux over current. So th this is constant for, for certain system. What is the SI unit of this Muschel inductance? SI unit is called Henry, okay? And one Henry is given by one Weber per amp. Or we, you can also write like this, one joule per amp square. This is the SI unit of Muschel inductance. Do you have any question here in that part? This is the Muschel inductance. You change the current within one coil and then you produce EMF in the second coil. Or you change the current by time within that coil, then you produce EMF and associated current within the second coil. For this reason, the name is Muschel inductance. Actually, you know the mechanism from the electromagnetic induction from the last lecture. So now let's talk about the applications. Here we have a toothbrush. So what we have here, there's a battery, okay? You can recharge it. And um, this is the uh, charging stage of the toothbrush. There is a battery and coil within that a toothbrush and there is another coil here this wire connected uh, to the wall socket okay so there is a coil here so alternating current comes uh, from the wall socket so then what is the meaning of alternating current you change the current by time right then you produce magnetic flux magnetic field lines so there is another coil here so uh, due to the changing current within that coil, you produce EMF within the second coil here, within the toothbrush, then you can fill or charge the battery within the toothbrush. This is the mechanism. Just this one. One coil is here, one coil is here. Another example, maybe you already know, this is a wireless charger. Here we have charger and this is the smartphone and this is the wire goes to the wall socket. So there is a coil here and there is another coil within the um, mobile phone and when you make this one close to each other so time varying current within that coil produces EMF in the second coil here then you can um, charge the battery within the mobile phone. So you can even uh, recharge many devices. This is AirPod, this is smartwatch, this is mobile phone. So there is a, there is a um, large coil here. And then we have second coils in each device. So we have alternating, um, alternating current here which is changing by time and then it produces EMF in the coil of the smartphone, in the coil of AirPod and in the coil of the smart watch. These are the applications of Muschel inductance. There are also many applications uh, but, but I think these are enough for you to express the importance of the topic in our real life. Do you have any question here in that part? Okay, now let's calculate the Muschel inductance problems. So uh, one of the question, one of the students at the beginning of my lecture told me that if we can solve more problems during the lecture, so I would like to express you again that um, I, I spent my time to finish all topics within the chapter. I would like to teach every part of the um, lecture and, and, and sub subsections within the lecture. So with that one, in addition to this, I also would like to uh, solve all examples within the chapters, okay? So I'm trying to do that for each chapter. 
So let me also do that for this one. But uh, for the problems at the end of the chapter, of course, I strongly suggest you to solve them after finishing each chapter. So here, what we have, um, you know, Tesla coil. Tesla coil is used in, in science museums okay as a high voltage generator which is very popular you can you can check from internet so you produce very high voltage okay so in one form of tesla coil a long solenoid with length l and cross sectional area a is closely wound with n number of turns of wire a coil with n two turns this one so runs it at its center. So it is clear from the picture. So what is the question? Find the motion inductance. The motion inductance is given by that expression. Look at this one. Motion inductance. Number of turns, flux, and the current. So uh, what we have here, we have flux have to calculate flux. Flux is given by B times area. So what is the B for, for this type of solenoid? We have done it in, in previous chapters, in chapter 28, mag, um, magnetic field uh, for the solenoid with n number of turns. Here we have mu zero n one times um, I one, the current in the system. So, um, N1 is the number of turns per unit length, which is given by capital N1 over L. So put them here, then we have magnetic field like this. We have done it in chapter 28. I will not go into detail. So just take this B1, put it there, and this is the area of the solenoid. And then finally, we have mutual inductance given by mu zero a n one n two over l. What do you see here? Motion inductance does not depend on the current. Here it depends current, but finally it does not depend on the current. This is constant. This is area of the uh, first coil. This is number of turns in the first coil. This is number of turns in the second coil, and this is the length in the first coil. So the motion inductance depends on the shape parameters of both uh, coils. So this, this was the calculating motion inductance. Here, there are also numbers are given, L area and number of turns. If you put them here, you can calculate 25 micro Henry. And what is the EMF due to mutual inductance? The EMF due to mutual inductance is given by that expression. This is the EMF in the second coil, which is equal to minus mutual inductance and rate of change of current in coil one. So then you can, you can solve it like this. Here, within the same system, let's consider that there is a current here in the outer coil. There is a current uh, which is given by I2 2 times 10 to 6 ampere per second per times T. So uh, by time, the current is increasing here. Okay, there is a time varying current in the outer coil. So um, what is the question? at time three microsecond, what is the average magnetic flux through each turn of the solenoid coil one due to the current in the outer coil? So uh, we have increasing flux and the question, what is the flux here within the first coil due to the current here? So um, you can use that expression. What do you see here? flux and current. You can use that expression, mutual inductance. If you take the magnetic flux from that formula, you can get this one, magnetic flux, 
Mutual inductance times current, you see I2, over number of turns, then you can calculate the magnetic flux within the first coil in, or inner coil. And then what is the second question? What is the induced EMF in this solenoid? Induced EMF is given by that expression. E1 is equal to minus mutual inductance and the um, current as a function of time. So here the current is given. Here we have two times 10 to six ampere per second times T. If you take the time derivative of that term, then you will get this one, two times 10 to six ampere per second. Then uh, mutual inductance is given here, mutual inductance. Just put that mutual inductance here. And then this is the um, time derivative of the current. We have done it here, put it there. Finally, you can calculate minus 50 volt. So this negative sign here, the direction of the EMF, which we have discussed all the things during the last lecture. So by using the lens law, you can, you can find the direction of the EMF. Any question here? Okay, then let's continue with self-inductance. What is self-inductance? Here we have a circuit, look at this one. This is an EMF, and then we have current from positive to negative, okay? And this is a coil in the circuit or uh, inductor, okay? Any circuit with a coil like this, that carries a varying current, has a self-induced EMF. If we have a constant current here, there is no EMF here. You have magnetic field lines uh, due to the coil design, okay? They are like this, magnetic field lines in the center, in, in within the coil and outside of the coil. So, but if you change the current within the circuit, if there is a time varying current, then what happens? This field lines, magnetic field within the coil changes, okay? And the flux here changes. So due to the changing flux, we have EMF, which is called as self-induced EMF, okay? So uh, this self-induced EMF is defined by self-inductance or just inductance. So this was mutual inductance, okay? If you have two coils, we are talking about mutual inductance, this one. But if you are talking about just single coil in a circuit and if the current is changing by time, then we are talking about self-inductance, okay? Not mutual inductance and different from the mutual inductance, but what about the um, formula for the self-inductance? Here we have number of turns in the coil in the circuit. This is the magnetic flux due to the current traveling in the circuit, and this is the current in the coil. So if the current is constant, then there is no EMF here, don't forget. And the EMF, self-induced EMF, within that coil, in, in that circuit, is given by minus L times rate of change of current in circuit. What do you see here? The current within the circuit changes by time. So if the current is constant, then this term is zero, then EMF is zero. So in order to see an EMF within that coil, we need time varying current in the circuit. So this is the self-inductance. Is there any question here related to the self-inductance? Then let me continue with the um, self-inductance. 
And what, what, is the, what is the aim to put such inductors within, within the circuits? So in the past, we have seen EMF sources, right? Like batteries or external EMF sources. We have seen resistors. We have seen capacitors. These are very important elements of a circuit. So what is the aim uh, of the inductor? What is the aim of a coil to put um, into a circuit? So we will, we will learn this one now. So the main aim is that an inductor opposes and suppress any rapid changes in the current. So if there is a sudden change or unwanted changes within the circuit, then this coil fights against this change, okay? And save your circuit, I can say. So now let me give you one example here. Here, what you see that um, there is an electrical power transmission system, okay? Uh, so, so we transfer electricity with, with that method. So um, here you see a lightning, lightning strikes here, okay? And then this causes a peak in the voltage or a spike in the voltage, okay? And this spike can damage uh, the components of the system. Or if you can, if you take electricity from that system to your home, so your electrical appliance can also be damaged due to the uh, lightning strikes, okay? Due to the sudden uh, increase in the voltage in the system due to the lightning, okay? So in order to prevent the systems, um, then we use inductors, okay? Large inductors are incorporated into the transmission system to minimize that spikes in the voltage. So what do you see here? There is, a, there is a changing current in the system. So let's consider that uh, there, there is a sudden increase in this uh, sudden increase in the voltage and then there is a change in the current in the circuit that's considered. Okay? So what is this EMF? The EMF within that coil fights against that change in the current, okay? Then you, you can save your circuits. So here again, um, it, this, based on the same information, here we have an inductor, a coil in the circuit. And here we have um, a source of EMF, but, but this is variable source. I mean, you can change the current within the circuit by manipulating the variable resistors within the EMF. So what happens? If I change the current in the circuit, then this inductor, this coil within the circuit fights against the change in the current, okay? So I would like to change the current by using that variable source of EMF. Then a self-induced EMF is produced here and it is fighting against that current. We will go into detail next lecture, but, but you should understand that the purpose of the inductors in the circuits is to oppose any variations in the current through the circuit. So this is, this is very important. In DC circuits, for example, if we have a DC circuit and if there's a change in the current, then uh, this coil fights against this change and stabilize the current in the system. So in application, if we have an alternating current, so you know that uh, the alternating current is already changing by time, okay? So what is the duty of the inductor inductors in case of alternating currents? So uh, even in alternating currents, sometimes 
current can increase suddenly, okay? Then this inductors prevent the system from that sudden increase or decrease of the current in the circuits, like, like this one. So this, this is the main property of the um, inductors, okay? We use them in the circuits. They are very important elements of the circuits, like EMF sources, like resistors, like capacitors. They're, they are also very important elements of the circuits. And the main duty of that uh, inductors uh, is that to, to stabilize the current, okay? Within the system. So now let's continue. What is the potential difference between the both end of the inductor, let's say? So here we have um, a circuit. We have EMF here. And then uh, let's consider we have a current changing by time. Then we have EMF here, self-inductance, okay? And what is the potential difference between A and B? The potential difference between A and B is given by that expression. L times self-inductance of the inductor or coil and time derivative of the current in the system. So uh, you, can, you can get the details in, in the hard copy page of the book. So how to, how to get this one, it is very easy. I will not go into detail, but the important thing is that, look at that, that expression. The potential difference between A and B is given by L times the I over DT. Look at the self-induced EMF, L times the I over DT, but here we have minus sign, okay? This is the self-induced EMF. This is the potential difference between both ends of the inductor. So now let's see what is the difference between resistor and inductor, okay? And what, what is the difference between the uh, potential difference uh, for, for the resistor and also inductor. So here we have a resistor and we have a current from A to B. This is higher potential, this is lower potential, and we have current from higher potential to the lower potential. So then the VAB, the potential difference between A and B is given by I times R, resistance of the resistor. And this is bigger than zero, positive number, okay? And look at the potential across an inductor, inductor here, but the current is constant. So what is the potential difference between A and B if the current is constant? So the VAB for the inductors is given by that expression, this one. So since the current is constant here, this term is zero because current is constant, current is not changing, okay? Then VAB is equal to zero. Here we have seen potential across a resistor. Here we have seen potential across an inductor, but with constant current in the circuit. Now let's talk about potential across an inductor with increasing current. What we have here, we have current, but uh, it is time varying, it, it is increasing. So what we have here, we have positive di over dt. Okay, this is positive. Then here we have VAB between A and B points or both ends of the inductor in the circuit. VAB is given by that expression. So uh, this, what about the direction of the EMF? So if there is an increasing or decreasing current in the circuit, then there will be EMF, right? There will be EMF in, in the inductor or in the coil. So what about the direction of that EMF? If the current is increasing, then this is positive. You see, this is positive. Here we have negative sign. 
then the EMF is negative. It means that it is opposite to the initial current. You see? Then what about potential across an inductor with decreasing current? Here again, same circuit, let's say. Here we have inductor, here we have a decreasing current, then this is a negative here, then here we have negative potential difference. So what about the direction of the EMF? Here we have a rate of change of current, okay, which is decreasing current, then this is negative, okay? Negative here, negative here, and then this is positive. So EMF is, um, in, this, is, is in the same direction with the current. So this, this, is, uh, this is like lens flow, okay? You, you, can, you can see that the system fights against the changes uh, in, in the circuit. You can consider it like this. So now let's um, try to calculate self-inductance. Here we have a toroidal solenoid. During the last lecture we have um, solved some problems by using that design of the solenoid, okay? Uh, this is the cross-sectional area of the toroidal solenoid. This n is the number of the turns. Okay, and there is a current here. So what is the question? Determine the self-inductance of a toroidal solenoid. Self-inductance is given by that expression, number of turns, magnetic flux over current in the system. Magnetic flux is given by B times A. Okay, and what is B? B we have calculated during the chapter 28 the magnetic field within the toroidal solenoid. You remember, we have chosen three regions. One is within the inner part of the toroidal solenoid, and one is here, and the other one is outside of the toroidal solenoid, and we have found that here in that region and outside of the toroidal solenoid, the magnetic field is zero. We have found that during the last lectures. In, in, in chapter 28. Then, just exactly within, within the um, toroidal solenoid, we have magnetic field given by that expression. So just put this B here, then magnetic flux, put it there. Then finally, you can calculate self-inductance of toroidal solenoid, which is given by mu zero n square area over two pi r. This is the radius. Actually, uh, we, we, call, we consider that the radius uh, does not change from this side to that side of the toroidal solenoid. We, we take fixed radius, but this is assumption. Don't forget this. And here we have number of turns. And here we have cross-sectional area. You see, this is mu zero. Uh, if if um, there is a non-magnetic uh, material here, or or if if uh, there is a vacuum here in that region, if there is a magnetic material, then this mu zero will be replaced by mu. Okay, don't forget this. We have also discussed all these things. So this is the um, self-inductance of toroidal solenoid. If you put numbers, then you can calculate the self-inductance, which is given by forty microhenry. Any question here? Okay, then uh, let me continue with um, self-induced EMF for the same toroidal solenoid. The self-induced EMF is given by minus uh, self-inductance and the rate of change of current in the circuit. So. What is the question? Find the magnitude and direction. Magnitude can be calculated like this. So inductance is already calculated, put it there. And what is the um, time rate of current? The, in the question, uh, it is given that 
the current increases uniformly from zero to six amp. Current is increasing, okay, in, in three microsecond. So uh, how to calculate this one? This is the change in the current from zero to six amp. The total change is given by six amp. Uh, what is the uh, time? It changes within three microsecond, three times 10 to six second. Then we have calculated this one, just put it there. Then we can calculate EMF produced due to the changing of the current in the, in the coil, in this toroidal solenoid, we can produce uh, 80 volt EMF. This is self-induced EMF. Okay, so now let's continue with magnetic field energy. With that one, I will finish um, the lecture today. So um, what do you see here? Let's consider that at the beginning, the current is zero here within the coil, okay? And then I use this EMF source and by using that EMF source, I spent some energy to, to, to um, transfer to the inductor here, okay? I will transfer energy from the um, EMF source to the inductor and I will see what will happen. So um, it is important to remind you that the resistance of the wire is zero, it is neglected, okay? In addition to that, we also consider that the um, resistance of the inductor is also zero, okay? Then there is no power or there is no energy dissipated within the uh, within the coil due to the resistance because we consider that the resistance of the coil is zero. So then let's calculate the power delivered to the, um, to the inductor by using that EMF source. The power delivered to the inductor is given by VAB times current. So what was VAB? VAB is given by that expression for the inductor. Just put that one into that equation, VAB, then here we have current in, in the circuit, okay? Then, what about the energy supplied to the inductor during an infinitesimal time interval dt, which is given by power times time, okay? Very, um, very short time, let's say. And then uh, just instead of P, put that expression. Okay, here we have DT. This DT will cancel this DT. Finally, I have energy supplied to the inductor during an infinitesimal time interval DT, this one. So uh, what do you see here? The total energy supplied by that EMF source to the inductor to increase the current from zero to a final value within that inductor, okay? So then I can, I can solve that integral. The energy stored in an inductor to increase the current within the inductor from zero to the final current, okay? Then here we have I di, so if you solve this integral, then we have this equation for the energy stored in an inductor. One half L times I square. This I square is the final current in the inductor and L is the self inductance or inductance of the inductor, okay? Then we have the energy stored in an inductor. So like in capacitors, you can store energy in inductors and it is very, very useful. I will talk about this. So then uh, let's compare with normal resistors. 
So here we have a resistor, and if you drive current through that resistor, all the energy delivered to the resistor will be dissipated. We have discussed this one during the previous chapters. Energy is dissipated due to the collusions of the um, charges within the resistor, okay? They will lose their energies and energy will be transferred to the system as a heat. We have discussed this one. And energy is dissipated. But in case of inductors, energy is stored within the inductor, okay? Don't forget this one. And then we can use that stored energy later on if we need okay so uh, this is the energy so what about the magnetic energy density magnetic energy density is the energy per unit volume okay so if you use that energy and if you divide that energy by volume of the uh, volume of the inductor you can calculate the magnetic energy density or energy per unit volume. So what we have here, we have uh, inductance, uh, we have current here, we know the inductance. So for example, for, a, for the toroidal system, inductance is given by that expression. What we have here, uh, N times flux over I, here we have B, you see, and B is given by that expression. So you can, you can write that inductance in terms of B due to the flux here. So if you uh, solve that one energy, um, then by, by using the inductance, then you can, you can get the magnetic energy density in vacuum. Then, which is equal to B square over two times mu zero. This is magnetic constant. This is magnetic field magnitude. What is this B? B is the magnetic field within the coil here, if there is a current, okay? Like this one, where is it? Let me show you, like this one, B is this one, okay? If you have a current, then you have B here. So the energy within the inductor is stored as B. Remember the capacitors. Within the capacitors, energy is stored as electrical field. In case of inductors, the energy is stored as magnetic field within the inductor. So we have this analogy. So now let's continue with that one. If, uh, so th this is, magnetic constant for vacuum. If there is a magnetic field within the coil, like this one, here we have toroidal solenoid, and if there is a vacuum here, then the mu is given by mu zero. But here, within the coil, if we have a ferromagnetic or paramagnetic material, which we have discussed during the last chapter, then you have to use mu here instead of mu zero, okay? This is magnetic energy density in a material. So what is the meaning of that? The meaning is that we can store energy within the inductor in the circuit and we can use that energy if we want it later on, okay? So here I will show you one example or one application of that magnetic energy density and um, magnetic energy stored in inductors. What do you see here? This is spark plug. Do you know what is spark plug? Uh, in Turkish we say buji, okay? They are used in, in engines. Here you see an internal combustion engine, işten yanmalı motor. Here we have a spark plug, bougie here, you see? Spark plug is this one. Here we have a mixture of, um, mixture of fuel and air, okay? And uh, this spark plug 
fires that mixture and then this piston moves okay and then um, the, the the engine is used to move the car for example so the, this is the design of the spark plug so you see the uh, this this part of the spark plug here there is a spark okay so what is the design of this one within that spark plug there are two coils remember the motion inductance motion inductance you see two coils so if you have um, time varying current within one coil then you can produce emf voltage here okay in the second one so this is given by that expression motion conductance so we have application here let me go into detail to explain the working principle this is the battery of the car which provides 12 volt okay and here we have two coils within that spark plug um, one with uh, very low resistance and less number of the coils red one and the other one many turns okay so um, this battery provides current for for that red coil let's say okay and then we store energy within the red coil so by using that switch we suddenly cut the current from battery to the coil then the current goes to zero in very short time within the red coil so then we have we have the i over dt we have the i over dt within that coil so due to a very short change in the current in the red coil we produce very large emf in the second coil so this large emf is used to fire the mixture here within the engine so this is the working principle of the spark plug in, in automobiles. There are also many other applications, but I think this is enough. So we, 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 can, we can use uh, stored energy in the first coil uh, to fire the mixture of the fuel and air in internal combustion engine. So now um, let's finish with that example this is my last transparency for today uh, storing energy in an inductor so um, the electric power industry would like to find efficient ways to store electrical energy generated during low demand hours to help meet customer requirements during high demand hours let's consider that during day people use electricity at home and also electricity is used in, in the industry okay so high demand hours during days and during night low demand hours so then um, you have to store the energy electrical energy during night and then you should provide enough um, let's say electric power or electric energy for the customers during the day so how to store that energy can we do that by using an inductor so um, or how to do that so the question is that what inductance would be needed to store one kilowatt hour of energy in a coil carrying a 200 amp current so you have a coil and it carries 200 amp current and then you would like to store that energy so then the question is that what is the inductance of that coil inducting the energy and inductance relation is this one this is the energy this is the inductance if you take the inductance from that equation you can write like this to u over i square this is the energy stored in an inductor this is the final current in the inductor then what about the energy actually it is given here so 
one kilowatt times hour. So uh, instead of kilowatt, just convert it to the watt. And then instead of hour, just convert it to the second. Then energy is given in joule, okay? So just put it there. Current is 200 N, which is given in the question. Put it there. So the inductance of the coil is given by 180 Henry's. It is huge inductance. Just compare the inductance of the toroidal solenoid here, which was around micro Henry. You see, micro Henry, I mean, it is more than 1 million times higher, let's say. Okay, huge inductance. So, in order to store that energy in normal, um, in normal coils, we need very large coils, room size coils, okay? Because uh, this, this current is huge and there will be huge heating in the coils. So in order to prevent the system from the heating, we should use very large area. I mean, if you go into detail of that inductance formula, so uh, you have to use a very large cross section of the wire and you have to use many many uh, number of turns then there will be an inductor with room size what you can do you can use superconducting inductor it can be much smaller because they have practically no resistance okay at, at low temperatures below the critical temperatures but then in order to cool the superconducting inductors, you need a cooling system and it also requires energy. So um, then the result is that this is impractical with present technology due to that huge, um, huge self-inductance of the system. Do you have any question with that one? So next lecture, I will continue with RL circuit. We have resistor and inductor in the circuit and I will talk about their behaviors. So how the current changes by time within such circuits. And then I will continue with LC circuits. Here we have inductor and capacitor. So what is the behavior of the current within that circuit and what is the energy so energy is transferred energy is stored here energy also stored here so what is the relation in between i will talk about this and then uh, i will also talk about lrc circuits here we have uh, inductor here we have resistor here we have capacitor and what is the behavior of current in that circuit I will discuss all the things during the last lecture and then we will finish that chapter. Do you have any question? If not, then let me close the session. See you on Thursday. Take care of yourself. Bye bye.